We are continuing our study in the Gospel of John, and uh, if you've been with us, uh, we've been in it for quite a few months, and uh, we are now continuing uh, with the last couple of days of Jesus' life, Jesus' ministry before the, uh, the cross. Uh, we're going to take several months to get to the cross, but it's going to be a slow study. I think you'll understand why John is writing what he's writing and why we're studying at the speed we're going to study it, because it's going to get deep. We're going to cover it a little bit slowly. Uh, and so I think you'll appreciate this morning why we're just going to take four verses, uh, because there's lots and lots to discuss. I even contemplated doing one verse, uh, but I thought, now we've got to put it into context and we'll do, we'll do four verses. Um, by way of introduction, John 13 starts, as you recall if you are with us a couple of weeks ago, ago with Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And you recall that I did it in the context of humility. I did it in the context of Jesus doing what a slave would do for his disciples. As his disciples argued who would be number one in the kingdom, uh, Jesus put the arguments to rest and said, I'm going to wash your feet. Then uh, you saw in our prior lesson, Judas Iscariot. And we saw Jesus demonstrating unfathomable love to the man he knew was going to betray him. And we answered a number of tough questions about Judas. And if you like that study, I said, hang on, we got another lesson about Judas coming. So as we get deeper into the uh, crucifixion story in our time in the Garden of Gethsemane, obviously Ju Judas will appear again. This morning, we look at Jesus' teaching as soon as Judas leaves the room. And as we transition into verse 31, it points out when he had gone out, he being Judas, that this is significant. It's as if Jesus waited until Judas left to tell them something he wanted them to know. Now, a number of things are going to happen through chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17 that are profound teaching lessons from Jesus to his disciples and some comments from the disciples back to Jesus. But it's very, very significant as Jesus gives this new command. It comes after he has demonstrated it by washing the disciples' feet. It comes after Judas is left. So keep that into context. We talk about what we're going to discuss because verse 31 says, When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Now, if you're just reading that on your own and you got a pen in, in your Bible, if you start to circle stuff, one thing ought to jump off the page. It's glory, glorified. It's used five times in what in the Greek is one sentence. In English, we break it into two sentences. And it's significant because it talks about a word that we think we understand what it means. But I want to do a little bit deeper dive and give you some application and some understanding of what Jesus is talking about here. Because if we talk about glory, we immediately think in a humanistic perspective. We think of football players. We think of uh, people in uh, entertainment culture. We think of glory going to someone because of personal achievement. In Jesus' context, it is significant because Jesus is talking about a different perspective than we do in glory. I mention it because there's a tremendous application for us not to, not to miss. Because the word here has as its Greek root word, to seem, to think, or to suppose. Now, our root word here about seeming or thinking something, over time in Greek culture began to view it in terms of a positive perspective. To think well of something. To think good of something. So our root word here to glorify means to think well of something. To, to seem it to be good, to suppose it to be a great thing. And I want to force you to, for, to change your perspective because our verb tenses tell us that something unique is going on with these words because I've highlighted in a slightly different color our verb tense shifting from the present tense to the future tense. When it refers to glory, referring to Jesus, or referring to any of his disciples, that's me and you, Glory is a comment. It is a reference of the good, not of achievement, but the good of the person. The good of the person. Because the glory of Jesus was not in his achievement. The glory of Jesus was in his person. And as Jesus applies what he's going to do and drives it home to us as believers, it is significant that we don't miss the fact that our glory does not reside in our achievement. 
So many times when we praise our kids or grandkids, we praise them for what they do. Oh, that was a great report card. That was a great uh, performance on the, on the sports field. Oh, that was great in some other capacity, but it's about what they do. If you want to praise your spouse for something they're doing for you, you want to thank them for something they, they did for you and providing something for you. I want to pause for a second and think, how many times do you praise those in your inner circle? How many times do you give them glory in your words or in your affection because of who they are versus what they do? Face it, we're all messed up in this regard. We give people praise for what they do for us. How many times do you look at your kids, your grandkids, your spouse, a coworker, and say, I want to appreciate you. I want to honor you because of the person you are for your character, for your mind, for your faith, whatever it can be. It can be a whole bunch of different things. But I want to challenge you this morning to think about how we think of glory because we think about it as achievement, success, performance. And when you think about it as a Christian, Jesus' use of this term, Jesus' application of this term is for us as individuals because of character, because of person. Now, you notice the end of this phrase, at the end of verses 32, it talks about he will glorify. He will be, he will, re, will receive glory, some of your translations may say. In the future tense, it builds upon the idea of character and says in the future, there'll be honor because of what they will do because of their character. So in other words, if the present tense is, I'm honoring you because of your character, I'm honoring you because of your faith, I'm honoring you because of your honesty, I'm honoring you because of your integrity. <laughs> I know in the future I don't have to worry about you because the actions you're going to demonstrate are going to be consistent with your person. So right now the cross hasn't happened, right? Jesus knows what's going to happen. Jesus knows he's going to be faithful. The disciples don't. So Jesus talks about God will glorify him. How can you say that with strength? How can you say that with assurance? Well, you know Jesus is just going to act as he goes forward consistent with his character. How do you know your spouse, your kids, your grandkids are going to do good in the future if you're giving them a target to shoot for, affirmation for their future? It's, I know you're going to be faithful. I know you're going to be good. I know you're going to be whatever the fill in the blank is because of your character. So you see, as it transitions into performance, it's not present tense performance. It's present tense person. It's present tense character. And if you build it backwards... What you're doing is you're recognizing performance or actions and then putting the person on the back end. The Christian perspective is person on the front end, knowing that from that character, from that heart, from that mind of goodness, then comes the performance consistent with that. So in our world, we frequently turn it upside down. In Jesus' world, it doesn't allow us to do it. A couple things about Jesus and his glory. The cross was the central and most significant part of human history. When it talks about something worthy of glory, it recognizes the person and the character that would spend his entire life walking towards something worthy of glory. It's not just simply being a great teacher. It's not just simply doing something profound to make something say, wow, I hadn't heard that before. It's going forward and saying he is walking towards the pivot point of human history. It reversed the conduct of the first Adam. Through all of human history, the reason why it's the pivot point in history is from Adam and Eve onward, we've been cursed by sin. We've been cursed by all of the fall. And Jesus says, I'm going to create a new way to do this. I'm going to create a totally new different perspective. And it reversed the power of Satan, his ability to condemn, his ability to corrupt, his ability to destroy, his ability to bring disease, his ability to bring failure. Jesus says, through me, going forward, anything is possible. Through him, all things are possible, as Paul told us. Now, if we get back to our idea of the, the future tense here. Is glorified and the justice of God was revealed. We see through the cross that is coming. The reason why Jesus is entitled to glory is because God, the Father, in coming up with the plan of Christ and salvation, recognized the idea that you got to have justice. Because if any of us are going to answer the question, how can I get to heaven? You got to have a concept of justice. If I get to heaven based on everything I've done in life, I may stack it up with a bunch of good, but how do I compare that to anything bad that I do? 
How do I compare that to anyone else in life and the bad they do? You've got to have a standard of justice. And the standard of justice is not the good outweighs the bad. In every single religious system in the history of humanity, justice is measured like the scales of justice that we see in Lady Justice on the courthouse. In the, you know, when I go to trial and I see Lady Justice up on the seal behind the judge's bench, or I see the scales of justice off to the side of the judge's bench, that's how humanity measures evidence of guilt. That's how humanity measures evidence of liability in the civil context when I try cases. God measures justice from an absolute standard. If there's one sin, we're disqualified. There is no good outweighing bad. When we stand in front of Christ, it's not a matter of lining up and say, look, here's how I was a good husband. Here's how I was a good wife. Here's how I was a good parent. Here's how I was a good employer, employee, grandparent, whatever it may be. We want to balance the scales of justice. We want to balance the scales of righteousness. With God, the standard is absolute perfection. Now, the point is we fail. We can't do a darn thing. We fail in our good. We fail in our bad. We fail repeatedly. So the encouragement is the only way we get there is we stand up and we say, I am here not because my good outweighs my bad. I'm here because you, God the Father, look at me through the lens of Jesus Christ. Now, the application is in living life, it's the exact same way. When I measure myself as an employer, it's not does the good outweigh the bad. Because see, if that's the standard, if I do a whole bunch of good, that means I've got permission to do bad for my employees. That's a real bad standard for the employees at the wrong end of the spectrum, right? If that's the standard with my kids, it's even more perverse. Because if I do a whole bunch of good for my kids, I got a little reserve of bad for my kids. And that's repugnant. And then you talk about your spouse. My goodness, if I do a whole bunch of good, that gives me permission to be bad on the weekends? Uh, no. no, that's not how it works. The standard is perfection. The standard is justice and righteousness. The standard is God's standard of perfection. And when we inevitably don't meet it, the approach is not, well, my good outweighs my bad, so just ignore it. My approach is, through Jesus Christ, I am striving for, perfect, for perfection. I'm striving for, for perfection in my employment. I'm striving for perfection in my social relationships. I'm striving for perfection with my kids. I'm striving for perfection with any relationship I have. And when I fail, the prayer is, God, make me more Christ-like. He is perfect, so if my desire in life is to be perfect, i got to be more like Him. I want to love perfectly. I want to give perfectly. I want to share perfectly. I want to be perfect in my communication. And I'm going to fail. But it's not a standard of good outweighing the bad. It's a standard of His perfection and becoming more Christ-like in what I do. The holiness of God is revealed. Once again, a standard we can't approach, but we see through the plan of God as lived out in the life of Christ, we see this standard of holiness, which means God can't just simply let anyone into heaven based on them being more good than bad. It's got to be holy. It's got to be just. Our third standard is the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God is seen in Scripture from Genesis up through Revelation. His faithfulness is there is a plan coming. The plan in Genesis is the same plan at the time of the disciples, is the same plan in Revelation, is the same plan today. The plan is, as we'll see in John chapter 17, the only way to God the Father is through Jesus Christ. In verses chapter 14, it talks about it. In chapter 17, it talks about it. We're going to see it again going forward in the Gospel of John. It's very, very profound. So we see justice, holiness, and faithfulness, and gives us a great application for how we apply those things in our lives. And it's also the love of God. It is interesting to me that those who criticize the plan of salvation, my agnostic friends that say God is barbaric if you're a Christian, because how could crucifixion of Jesus, his son, be a loving act? And the problem of my agnostic friends is a failure to recognize that that perspective that the agnostics have, that it's only a question about Jesus, ignores the rest of humanity. It ignores me and you. 
Because while an agnostic may look at the cross, the cross and the crucifixion and say, that's just barbaric. How could God the Father possibly do that? Is someone who does not appreciate that that sacrifice was for them. That sacrifice was for them. That sacrifice was for me and you. And when I hear that, when you hear that, it's humbling. It's supposed to break us. It's supposed to move us to tears that that kind of love to give up your son, to give up the essence of you, the oneness of you, is truly profound. So with that background, we then move into verses 33, and notice how he says children. Children is a fascinating way to look at the disciples, because it's the same way he looks at us. Because he starts out by recognizing that those people who are with him, some of which, in fact, I'd be willing to argue, most of which were older than him, he refers to as children. We don't know because Scripture doesn't tell us how old the disciples are, But given that Peter ran the fishing business, given that Matthew was the number one tax collector in the region, given all we we know about the other disciples, we know that some of them most likely were older than 33 years old, that had been in business for a couple of decades. They had a very significant influence in their business sphere. That typically doesn't happen in your 20s or early 30s in our culture, much less in Jesus' culture when business prominence was associated with seniority. So odds are very high Jesus picked disciples much older than him, and he calls them children. Why is he referring to them as children? Because when God looks at us, he does not look at biological age. When Jesus looks at us, he looks at us in terms of our spiritual age. The reason why is he created us as eternal beings. We were created to live with him in eternity. So if we're created as eternal beings, what is fill in the blank for your age? It's a blip in in your life. It's a blip in your eternal existence. So he doesn't look at us as 25, 35, 45, 55, 65, 75, 85, whatever you may be. He looks at us in terms of our spiritual age, as it relates to eternity with him. Now, in heaven, we're going to get tremendous progress. We're going to see him as he sees uh, all of creation. We're going to see everything in heaven. We're going to see our past, our present. We're going to see eternity with him. But it's fascinating to me that he refers to these men who spent three years at his feet as children. So, The application for us is when we slip up, remember that the way God views us is children, which is the same way we view our kids or our grandkids, which is out of recognition of number one, there needs to be patience for their immaturity. Number two, there's a recognition that actions have consequences, but our loving parent guides us through those consequences. And then number three, with guidance, our future will be better. So just like we encourage our kids and our grandkids when they trip up, what do we say? I still love you. You still have to deal with the consequences. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But if you'll do as I say in the future, you'll discover less pain, less problems, (laughs) less shortcomings, less trip ups, less embarrassment, less whatever it may be. So as you think about your failures in life, as you think about your failures as a parent or grandparent, if you think about your failures as a spouse, you think about your failures in in the employment world, in the relational world with friends or family members, think about God treating you the way you treat your kids and grandkids. Sometimes you shake your head and you say, I can't believe they're mine. (laughs) Sometimes you just smile with joy and say, I remember when I did that. But we all approach them with love and understanding, and we realize they got to deal with some consequences, but we're going to get them through it. And then you love them through it. If you have that perspective on your failures, it puts you in a position to do ministry for the first time in your life. Because the biggest problem I encounter when I have breakfast or lunch or talk on the phone with somebody about why they're not doing more, why they're not doing more to be a light and to be the love of God in the world. The number one excuse I get 
is I can't because of fill in the blank in their past. It's some embarrassment. It's some sin. It's some shortcoming. It's some failure. It's something. And they think because I know people that are doing ministry that have not had that kind of mess up. They say, I can't do it. I'm disqualified. God doesn't want me. They won't accept me. And the recognition of this teaching point of children is that God views us based on our spiritual maturity, and he views us as children in our immature faith to love us through it, to help us deal with the consequences of our immaturity, and to make us better if we'll just let him do it. Now, notice he says, I'm with you a little while longer. It's significant that he's reminding them yet again he's about to go away. When he dies on the cross, they're not going to remember this point that he said, I'm only going to be here a little while. At this point, the depression starts to set in. Their minds are reeling. They don't understand what's going on. They think he's going to be an earthly king. And he says, I'm only with you a little while longer. Now, the important application for us on this point is we've got a Savior whose time on this earth was limited in order that his time away from this earth may be greater. In other words, if Jesus was here, we would want to go to wherever he is. We would, if he's not in Houston, we would not want to be in Houston, right? If he is in some other part of the world, we want to be there. But when he limited his time here in order to be greater away from here, we get Jesus Christ wherever we are, whenever we are, however we are. So you can be in the middle of the ocean by yourself, and he's still with you. You can be here at church surrounded by a hundred here or a thousand in worship. He's still there. You can be at home by yourself. You can be in the midst of a huge stadium. You can be anywhere and he's still there because he chose to only be here for a little while longer. Now, interesting, he says, you will look for me. This is fascinating to me because when he died and they put him in the, in the grave and he rose again, the greatest manhunt in human history was for the body of Jesus Christ. The reason, one of the many reasons why I'm a believer is because the Jewish culture of the day was premised on finding the dead body of Jesus Christ. It's not talked about in scripture. It's not talked about in the history books. But we know contextually that when the open grave was found, the greatest manhunt in human history, the greatest bounty ever put out on a man's life would have been what the Jewish leaders did in order to preserve their religion, which had to be a religion without Jesus Christ because he told them what was going to happen. He told them he was the Messiah. They could look back at Isaiah and the Psalms and see what was going to happen. And so the greatest way to preserve humanity, the greatest way to preserve Judaism was to find the dead body of Jesus. After the greatest manhunt in human history, they still came back to an empty grave. Compound that with hundreds and hundreds of people seeing the resurrected Christ, as we learn about in the Gospels, as we learn about in the writings of Paul in 1 Corinthians, and you combine those two things with the evidence of Jesus' resurrection, the person of Jesus resurrected, the changed lives of Jesus resurrected, and the greatest manhunt in human history coming up negative, and the fact that they looked for him and didn't found him, didn't find him, is the cornerstone of the reason why we can have faith. Now he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. Now this is a fascinating point because don't misunderstand this in terms of us spending eternity with him. This is not a reference to uh, anything about heaven. He's talking in our heavenly, uh, sorry, in our earthly state. We can't step into heaven for a peek and say, oh, there he is. He's at the right hand of God. Now, a couple of people in history have been given a glimpse into heaven. Paul writes about it. We studied him last year, and we are studying the life of Paul. But Jesus is saying, you can't come peek in on me and see how I'm doing and having a dream one night, and then all you guys come back and live your earthly life. And the perspective on us is, I can't see him today, but he can always see me. I'm not seeing him at this minute, but I know he's watching me. So many times in our life, we live our lives thinking he's not watching. <laughs> I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do because I think he's not watching. And it's the amazing aspect of Christianity that we live our lives thinking he's not watching when in fact he's always watching. 
not only is he watching to see what we do, he knows what our thoughts are. He knows what our ideas are before they come into our brain. He knows everything about us. And it's truly profound that where he is, we cannot go, but he can always see where we are and what we're doing. We get into the essence of our lesson in verses 34, when verse 34 says, I give you a new command, love one another, just as I've loved you, you must also love one another. Now, if you've been in church very long, you've probably heard a lesson on agape love. I titled the lesson, The Greatest Love. I want to give you a little bit of digression on this that I hope gives you a perspective that you've not had before. And then most importantly, I want to give you an application because agape love is essentially self-sacrificial, unconditional love. And what I want to teach you is that in Greek culture, it was so rare as to be almost unheard of. If you go back and study non-biblical Greek language, this type of love was so rare, was so unthought of, was so unpracticed, that the number of times I can find it in non-biblical literature, you can count by the dozens. Every other Greek word for love I can find in the hundreds of thousands or millions. It was used so frequently in Greek literature. So in Greek literature, the standard of the ideal love was the phileo love of the, the social love of a brother or sister my brotherly love of someone that I work with, my brotherly love or sisterly love of someone in my neighborhood. I like them. I like hanging out with them. I do things for them. It can be a very uh, honorable kind of love, but it's the kind of love because of a social circumstance. Brotherly love, sisterly love is driven by social circumstance. The idea in their culture was that it progressed and it could be seen as slightly different with our families. The storge love would be the love of a spouse or the love of a child or the love of some other kind of relative. And in Greek culture, this was building towards their ideal of eros, which was a romantic, a passionate kind of love, and it ended. In our culture, we do the exact same thing thing. You might think that America and the Western world in the 21st century has progressed beyond the Greeks of the first century. Read any magazine, read any book, watch any movie. It's the exact same concept. The ideal love starts with brotherly love or sisterly love. My friends, those that I hang out with, those that I work with, you get special bonds in a family relationship and it builds towards love. It builds towards the love story. It builds towards the romantic comedy of books and movies that everybody's attracted to. But the idea in culture of having an agape love is just as foreign in our world today as it is in Jesus' world of the first century. Now, let me digress for just one second and give you a biblical perspective on love, because I think it should transform the way you think about the word, use the word, and apply the word. We all usually in some capacity tell somebody on a daily basis, I love you. We say it to significant others. We say it to our kids or grandkids. We say it sometimes to good friends, people we work with. When you say, I love you, what are you saying? A biblical definition of love is that I am committed to your best interest. I get that from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Love is this, love is that. Long list. I taught it to you. We did an entire lesson on it when I taught you the life of the Apostle Paul. It is Jesus saying, or sorry, Paul saying through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit what love is. My distillation of that, my summary of that is that love is a commitment to someone else's best interest. Now, why do I say that? Because when I say that it's a commitment to someone else's self, my commitment to someone else's self-interest, it's unconditional. It does not require them to do anything, to say anything, to be anything. I'm saying I am unconditionally committed to your self-interest. If it is sacrificial, that means I'm giving of myself what I don't owe. I'm giving of myself what I don't have to give. It is a loving act towards someone else. But when I say I'm committed to your best interest, notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying I'm passionate to you. 
I'm not saying that it's driven based on how I feel today or might not feel tomorrow. It's not driven based on circumstance. If I feel good today, therefore I'm going to love today. I'm healthy today, therefore I'm going to love today. There's none of that. It is not driven by feelings. It is not driven by circumstance. So when I say to someone, I love you, if I've got time to explain this, I explain it just like I'm teaching it to you guys. And I say, when I say I love you, it is not a feeling. When I say I love you, it is not circumstantially driven. When I say I love you, it is not responsive to what you've done to me. When I say I love you, I'm saying to you, I am committed to your best interest. Now, what if they don't reciprocate? Doesn't matter. If I'm loving them, my commitment is to love them agape, sacrificially, unconditionally. What happens if circumstances change? Doesn't matter. I'm going to love them sacrificially, unconditionally. Now, folks, this becomes really, really easy in our families. A couple of challenges. Number one, with our kids, we frequently want to be committed to them for their best self-interest. But with kids or grandkids, we substitute our interest, right? We decide what we think is best for them. We decide what's best for their academic career, their sports career, their social career, their whatever it may be. And the younger they are, the more we can get away with this. But the older they are, the less we can get away with this. And being committed to their best interest recognizes how God made them, recognizes what God did not make them to do, recognizes taking the bent that God gave in their mentality and their physicality and their social structure, we've got to say the way God made you, I'm going to unconditionally and self-sacrificially love. With a spouse so many times, with a dear loved one so many times, it's based on feelings, it's based on what they do, it's based on their conduct. We've got to get to a point in becoming more Christ-like to say, I'm going to love you. I'm willing to love you. I'm challenging myself to love you as God loves you, which is the exact same standard identified for you. It's unconditional. It's sacrificial. Now, we see in Christ, as he applies this, he says to love one another. Our challenge is never loving people that are just like us. Loving people just like us is easy. Loving our kids or grandkids, easy because they're just like us. Loving people that work with us, easy, because they're just like us. Loving people in the Sunday school class, that's easy, because by and large, they're just like us. But think about the application to those that are not just like you, and this becomes real hard, real fast. Because if you pause for a minute and think about those that are not like you, I'm not talking about racial, although that could be an application. I'm not talking about socioeconomic, although that could be an application. You want to get real political real quick? Talk about self-sacrificial, unconditional love for someone of a different political persuasion than you. You want to get real volatile real quick? Talk about sacrificial, unconditional love for someone with a different sexual orientation than you. This gets real personal real quick. Jesus' standard is love another, unlike you. The same way you love a spouse, unconditionally, self-sacrificially. The same way you love kids and grandkids, unconditionally, self-sacrificially. See, you apply that in your family. It's like, yep, Chris, I can check the box. We're good. Time to go to Luby's. But I start talking about LBGT, Democrat, anything else that's radically unlike you, racial, socioeconomic, any other spectrum of life, radically different than you. A lot of Christians are like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's hard. And that's the point. That's why the first lesson after Judas leaves is I'm going to make you different than everyone else in the culture. I'm going to make you different than everyone else in the world. I'm going to push you outside of your comfort zone where you do not want to go to love everyone, one another. What's the standard? As I have loved you. Hard question. How did he love? With his very life. Everything he had. 
So we've got to love those different than us, even if we don't like them, we don't like their lifestyle, we don't like their place in life, we don't like the consequence of life, we don't like the choice of life, we don't like the person of life, we just don't like them. The standard is love as Christ loved. Now, the significance for us is we can't do that. You and I lack the ability to love as Christ loved. Why? Because we're fallen sinners that have yet to get to heaven. Face it, straight up. You can leave here motivated. You can leave here challenged. You can leave here saying, I can do that, Chris. And then you walk out and you fail by lunch, right? Within the hour. And the only way we can love as Christ loved us is by letting Christ in us love them. Face it, straight up. You cannot do what he challenges us to do in this lesson. You can't love people not like you because your willpower, your heart, your mind won't go there. Your sin nature pulls you back into loving people only just like me and you. We put him in charge. And you say, it's hard to love. I'm not sure I can love. I don't know how to love. I turn it over to you. When we turn it over to him, he gives us opportunities to love. He gives us ways to love. He gives us people to love. He gives us different mechanisms of love. We did not know that were in our heart. If you wonder how that's possible, think back to the loving relationships in your life that did not start out lovingly. Think about an enemy that became a friend. Think about someone that did something mean to you that later you had a reconciliation. Think about somebody that hurt you that you got through forgiveness. You've got instances in your life where you can see evidence of God doing for your heart what you did not think was humanly possible. You may think, God, after this hurt or pain, I can't love that way again. God, in light of this situation, I can't do that again. God, in light of that person, I can't love them the way you want me to love me. The standard is on our own, we lack the ability to do it. It takes a transformation of him in our lives to say, I yield to you. You do whatever you want to do. And the command is we must love one another, which is unconditionally, no limitations, all differences. Now, it's interesting how he ends. He says in verse 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have agape for one another. Think about the standard. They don't know we are Christians by our testimony, by your story of salvation. They don't know you're a Christian by how many times you come to church. They don't know you're a Christian by how many times you read your Bible and pray during the week. They don't know you're a Christian by how many times you engage in some kind of civil protest of something you don't like as a Christian. They don't judge you or they don't know your disciples based upon whether or not you are in favor of something or opposed to something, whether you support something or don't support something. It's a recognition that by loving other people, they will know we are disciples. Why is that true? Because the prior point was our human nature lacks the ability to love. You don't see a situation typically where we are loving others that are radically different ourselves. Now, we've made a lot of strides Racially in this regard, thank God, and God has moved in our country in a way that we see more reconciliation than we did in decades past. We see more social economic status. We see more reconciliation across social economic lines. But in those areas where we still lack behind, where Christians don't minister, Christians don't love, if it doesn't match their political ideology or their sexual orientation ideology or whatever it may be, is a challenge for us to say, God, I got a blind spot. I got problems there. Let that world see that I'm a disciple of you. Non-condemning, non-judgmental, non-trying to change, and loving as Christ did with his entire life. The most fascinating criticism to me of Jesus by the people of his day was that Jesus was a friend of sinners. It was the greatest condemnation the Jewish leaders of the day could make because it meant he was disqualified from coming into the temple. As a good Jew, you would not hang out with prostitutes. As a good Jew, you would not hang out with someone of a different religious belief system, Gentiles. As a good Jew, you would not hang out with people of moral failures, tax collectors, 
all kinds of bad people. And Jesus relished the idea of being a friend of sinners. Without compromise, never compromised one ounce of who he was, what he said, what his ministry was. He said, I am going to love you as God loves you. How does God love us? Sacrificially, Jesus on the cross, unconditionally, with grace and mercy and love. So the challenge for us in a world that so desperately needs is for us to love outside of our comfort zone. Now, that means something different with somebody you just met versus somebody you've known for decades. It's a progress. It's not, you know, love them like you love your spouse when you first meet them. There's got to be some building. There's got to be some trust. There's got to be some growth. But the application for us is profound. And the application is really twofold. Number one, God put this lesson in our text right after Judas leaves the room as saying the first thing he could possibly say to grab their attention to be bookends with the last thing he's going to say before he steps out into the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'm going to teach that to you when we get to it in John chapter 17, and I'm going to come back and tie up the point here. But the most significant lesson he gives is the one commandment that does not exist in Exodus, Leviticus, or Deuteronomy. It doesn't exist in all the rest of the New Testament. It's Jesus' command that forms the bedrock going forward for any command that exists in all of Scripture is love one another. It doesn't set aside any prior commands. It doesn't take uh, precedent over any prior commands. It's a new command to serve as the bedrock for how we're going to live our life. So as Judas leaves the room and he says, I got one chance to tell you guys something. Here's where we're going to start. He starts, I believe, with the number one foundational command for us to live our lives and to be known as disciples. And that is love in ways that our human nature does not want to love. It's a profound challenge. It's hard for us. It's difficult for us. I struggle as much as you guys do. And every time I get an opportunity to love, I, I see it and I react to it. And then God or someone I'm close to that's supposed to remind me of it will say, we got an opportunity to bless them. We got an opportunity to say something to them. And so as I go into application, my second point of thinking, how can you do that? Let me give you some just closing words of application. Number one, you got to pray for opportunity because in most of our lives, we don't have opportunities to really love those not like us because we just surround ourselves with people like us. Our work, our neighborhood, our social community, our church community looks just like us. Pray, God, push me outside of my comfort zone. He will answer that prayer very, very quickly. <laughs> Number two, when he answers that prayer, give yourself, give your attention, give your words. Give your time. Number three, God did not give you that opportunity to solve a problem, but to get to know a person. God does not put you into the life of some other person to show up and say, let me tell you what I learned in church last Sunday. Let me tell you what I learned in life. Let me tell you what I learned in my experiences. God did not put you into someone's life to necessarily solve their problems. Now, if you get into their life and you discover a problem you can solve, that's great. But you don't go in thinking, God sent me here to fix you. God sent me here to save you. God sent me here to solve you. That may be true, but God sent you into their lives to do what Jesus did, which was to be a friend to people different than you, just like he did, a friend to sinners. No compromise, but a friend to others not like you. And then the final point is, think of something simple that you can give them. Think about something really, really simple. It might be a thank you card. It might be an encouragement card that you can mail to them or give to them the next time you see them. It might be a book. For years, I carried a little copy that I'd get for $3 of Josh McDowell's More Than a Carpenter. It's about 120 pages long, a little pocket size. I'd keep 10 of them in my briefcase. I'd give them out. Whatever it may be, whether it's a card with something printed on it, with a little prayer on it, whether it's a card you could buy at Hallmark and write a little note on it, whatever it may be, think about something tangibly that I can give to someone to say, I care about you. I'm praying for you. I'm encouraging you. I'm so glad God brought us together. Because that little act of giving something to someone, a little card, a little note, a little bit of your time, a little bit of your attention, is a bridge. And the bridge 
is the opportunity for your next encounter. The next time God gives you a chance to be his eyes, his hands, his ears, his feet, mm -hmm. to go to them, to listen to them, to see them, to hear them. And what happens if you keep building one little bridge to a next day, one little bridge to the next week, one little bridge to the next month, then you're in a position to meet a need. Then you're in a position to be an answer to their prayers. Then you're in a chance to be in a position to let them talk let them express their problems, their fears, their failures. They may never be willing to go to our church. They may never be willing to open our Bible. But if you approach them as a friend, not trying to fix them, a friend not trying to save them right then, a friend not trying to better them in some way that you think is better for them, but you approach them as a friend, you are demonstrating agape love. You're sacrificing your time, you're sacrificing your attention, you're sacrificing your priorities. So I'm going to prioritize this person who's different than me. To love them as Christ's love, which is willing with his entire life, willing to give up his life so that others would know we are his disciples. Who are those others? Number one, the person you're ministering to. And number two, it's everyone in their life that they tell about you. If you give someone a card with a prayer on it, you give someone, send them a little note, or you just write them a two-little sentence, I'm so glad I met you. I look forward to talking to you next week. Or I look forward to seeing you next month. They are going to tell somebody. You're never going to believe who I met. They are so nice. You're never going to believe who I met. They touched me so deeply. And the one that just makes me break down in tears sometimes when they say to their friend or their family, I met my answer to prayer. I've been praying for this, and this person just showed up. I've been praying for this, and this person was kind to me. I prayed for this, and this person talked to me. I prayed for this, and this person gave me a little card saying how much it meant to them that we got to have breakfast together, whatever it may be. And when that person can articulate a prayer to a God that they may not fully comprehend, they may not know, they may not study, but they can recognize the answer to, I'm in trouble in my life, and I pray to a God that I barely know, God help me, and you show up, now you've got an opportunity to change them and introduce them to God the Father through Jesus Christ who lives in your heart and my heart. Folks, that's a transformative life. That's a life where you're changed by being more Christ-like, and they're changed by being more Christ-like. And it's a group of people that don't look anything like you and me. That's who God wants us to minister to. That's who God wants us to be a friend to, just like Jesus on this earth. So our challenge this week is pray for that opportunity. When you get that opportunity, be a friend. When you get that opportunity, be his eyes listening, his eyes seeing, his ears listening, his feet going. And don't try to fix somebody. Don't try to solve a problem. Just be Jesus and listen. Just be Jesus and touch. Just be Jesus and be there. And watch the world around you change one person at a time. You do that this week? Amen. All right. Amen. Next week, John chapter 14. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the chance to come and study your word. We thank you for the opportunity to know you. We thank you for the opportunity to know your word. We thank you for the opportunity to go to places that we don't want to go through your challenge, through your opportunities, through your will. And we thank you for the chances that you give us to love, to agape, those outside of our families, those outside of our work group and our family group, those outside of our comfort zone, that you would just give us an opportunity to be a light in a very dark world, love in an unloving world, and you in a world that does not know you or see you. We are humbled to have the opportunity. We're blessed to have the opportunity. Thank you for loving us, to give us the opportunity. Protect us until we're here again together next week. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. See you next week.